Johnson's other intimate friend, Edgar Hoover, also stood for the opposite of what Johnson was trying to achieve. Hoover was a white supremacist at the head of a white FBI. To him, black civil rights leaders were left-wing agitators, quite possibly in the pay of the Kremlin. In the name of fighting communism, you could do anything, sacrifice ideals, compromise principle, trivialize social sensitivity. Uh, you could uh, demonize the saints and, and, and canonize the devil as long as you were fighting communism. Under Hoover, the FBI had become a political police force using bugging, telephone tapping, burglary, and forgery, all in the name of internal security. In August 1963, Hoover had set up a special unit to watch Martin Luther King. It reported that the American Communist Party had planted two senior and secret members in Dr. King's entourage, where they had become close advisors. One was a Jewish lawyer named Stanley Levison, the other a former young socialist, Clarence Jones. Was I ever, in fact, a member, a card-carrying member of the Communist Party? The answer is no. It's not as if Martin King could be led by the nose by a Stanley Levison or by a Clarence Jones. That's absolutely nonsense. Martin King, to Hoover, was a Negro that he couldn't control. He was, in the classic case, the uppity, arrogant nigger. Without providing any evidence of communist infiltration, Hoover had persuaded the Attorney General, Robert Kennedy, to authorize telephone taps on Dr. King and the two subversives he was supposed to be consorting with. Kennedy agreed to a trial period of one month secret surveillance. By the time Kennedy's authorization ran out, Johnson was president. Hoover quietly kept the taps in place. The watch on King was codenamed Operation Zorro, and assistant director William Sullivan was put in charge of Hoover's special unit. A nine-hour meeting produced an expanded action plan. It ranged from the use of hidden microphones in hotel rooms used by King to the planting of prostitutes in his offices as secretaries. There was no discussion of contacts with communists, a field of inquiry the FBI had quickly abandoned as unrewarding. Instead, they decided to focus on King's private life in the hope, this is a quote from the record, of exposing King as an immoral opportunist. Arthur Murtaugh, then a field agent in the FBI's Atlanta office, was a member of the team. Hoover wanted it done. I don't think there was any justification of it at all. There wasn't anything. We had no information that uh, King was in any way uh, un-American or uh, in violation of the law. Uh, the Bureau was interested in destroying him because uh, Hoover wanted him destroyed. The FBI's operation now moved from Washington to Atlanta, where King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, was placed under 24-hour surveillance. In December 1963, FBI agents set up shop in an unoccupied building on the opposite side of the street. Everyone entering and leaving was photographed, including King, who was to be followed wherever he went in America. The agents involved all knew the objective, to gather evidence Hoover could use to destroy King as a civil rights leader. They started off hating him because he was black. He was a, I hate to use the phrase, but he was a nigger. The agents that I was working with on this particular squad had been brought up to believe that uh, all black people were dangerous, that they were uh, uh, dishonest, that they lacked character, that they were uh, sexual perverts, uh, all kinds of uh, hatred. Murtaugh says it was the most extensive surveillance operation ever undertaken by the FBI. Inside the Bureau's Atlanta headquarters, 10 agents assigned to the case were given their own segregated area. In one room, Agents recorded all telephone calls to and from the SCLC offices and King's home on nearby Johnson Street. In another room, again, according to Murtaugh, 
Hoover's G-men busied themselves by dreaming up imaginative schemes for the entrapment of the Reverend King. Whether the new president knew what his friend Hoover was up to, we do not know. What is clear is that while Hoover was trying to sabotage progress on civil rights, Johnson was doing everything he could to promote it. It was now Christmas time, and after four exhilarating weeks in power, the president was spending the holiday at his Texas ranch with Lady Bird and the girls, Linda Bird and Lucy Baines. With his civil rights bill uppermost in his mind, Johnson now hit on the novel idea of inviting half a dozen black leaders and their wives to stay at the ranch as his guests. Sadly, a winter storm intervened. The excursion was canceled. Instead, King and the others were invited to meet the president at the White House after the holiday. From New York, Clarence Jones booked a suite for King at the Willard Hotel in Washington. The FBI intercepted the call. On the afternoon of January 5th, Special Agent LWP Cherndorf led a three-man team on an illegal break-in at the Willard. Operation Zorro now took a significant turn. For the first time, the agents deployed hidden microphones, seven altogether, not to gather evidence of subversive contacts, but to find out what King might do in the privacy of his hotel room. I had to assume that they would be tapping him and watching him and under surveillance, so he should be careful, all right? Uh, I don't think he had any idea, I certainly didn't, of the magnitude or the detail of the surveillance. I think if he had, I think he would have been petrified. Early next morning, King left his Atlanta office for Washington. FBI Atlanta passed his arrival time to FBI Washington, 10.24 a.m. King was observed at National Airport. After checking in at the Willard Hotel, King left for the White House, where he joined three other black leaders. Uh, I think the president uh, is doing a very good job in civil rights. He has made it clear publicly and privately that he's committed to civil rights in general and to the civil rights bill in particular. And from all indications, he plans to take a forthright stand on this issue and a very consistent one. So as it stands now, we feel that the president is doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. So here was the liberal Lyndon Johnson leading America into a social revolution there was the head of his federal police force going all out to frustrate him. Friends of Martin Luther King have told us that on his travels in the South, King never felt physically safe. But at the Willard Hotel in Washington, King thought he could relax with his friends. King didn't know about the listening post the FBI had set up in an adjoining suite. For 17 hours, agents recorded conversations between King and several colleagues and visitors, two of whom were women. Let me just say this. Whatever occurred during that 17-hour period in that hotel suite that, the, that concerned Hoover, that was between Martin King and his family and Martin King and his God. William Sullivan and Edgar Hoover went through the tapes together. The bugging team was told it had unearthed enough to destroy Dr. King. Hoover ordered a full transcript to be made and a summary to be hand carried to the White House. An internal memo suggests it was shown to Walter Jenkins, White House Chief of Staff and the President. The White House or President Johnson Neither in the LBJ telephone tapes nor in other available records is there any evidence pointing to Johnson's involvement. If he did read the Willard Hotel bedroom transcripts, he would not have wanted them to be leaked. Clarence Jones explains why. If that kind of information had come out, it would have been used to discredit. Martin King would have been used to discredit the civil rights movement would have been used as a very, and probably effectively used, as a smokescreen to say, you see the kind of people who really want these civil rights, you see the kind of people they really are, you're not dealing with people who are, who are, who are legitimately oppressed, you're not dealing with people who are people of character or good morality and all this, 
and all this moral plea to the consciousness. Look at the kind of people they are. They're people who are communists. They're people who engage in, uh, in, uh, in uh, so-called immoral activities. I think it would have been devastating. The success of the Willard Hotel sting stimulated Hoover's appetite. More than a dozen FBI field offices were drawn into Operation Zorro as King traveled across America from Hawaii to New York. And FBI records show, or claim, that he was caught out in at least two more sexual encounters. On March 9th, the president and the FBI chief spent four hours together in the Oval Office. Hoover, after four decades as head of the FBI, was nearly 65 and facing mandatory retirement. Only special legislation could keep him in office. If Johnson had wanted to get rid of Hoover, this was the time to do it. But Johnson had never failed Hoover, and he didn't fail him now. J. Edgar Hoover celebrates his 40th year as head of the FBI. The FBI chief will reach retirement age this year. But President Johnson has signed a bill permitting him to stay on. It's a happy anniversary for Mr. Hoover. On July 2nd, the 1964 Civil Rights Bill, outlawing institutionalized segregation, was approved by the Congress and signed into law in the East Room of the White House. Dr. King, now the undisputed leader of black Americans, was placed close to the president's chair. Also there, but on the sidelines, was Edgar Hoover. President Johnson greeted him warmly. Hello, Edgar. Glad to see you, my man. Deserve... Indisputably, the new law of the land was now on the side of Martin Luther King, but the nation's chief law enforcement officer failed to call off his vendetta. A written FBI directive said this. We must intensify our coverage of King, this moral degenerate. The main goal is to neutralize or completely discredit the effectiveness of King as a Negro leader. On the 15th of July, Hoover's agents went to the Bell Company's Atlanta Switching Center and doubled the number of taps on the Southern Christian Leadership Conference's telephone lines. FBI men monitoring calls between Coretta King and her absent husband noticed that his frequent travels were straining their marriage. A telex to Hoover said this. There is increased evidence of marital discord in the King family. The current situation could conceivably result in a breach between the principals. Or better still, a divorce. Armed with a permit called a trash recovery order, signed by the chief himself, the agents now delved into the trash cans outside King's Atlanta headquarters. They were looking for a sample of the handwriting of Andrew Young, the movement's personable office manager. Then the forgers went to work. They took the handwriting, duplicated it, wrote all kinds of messages uh, to Mrs. King, uh, trying to make it appear that uh, people who were very close in his own personal circle were involved uh, sexually with his wife, trying to get warfare going between the players in the, in the King camp. King was spending a couple of weeks at home in Atlanta working on a book. One evening, FBI men monitoring his phone calls learned he was to visit a woman friend. Well, there was some indication that King was going to see this particular woman for illicit sex. They had an elaborate scheme. I was in the office that night, I remember. And uh, they made the call to the fire department from the office and told them that there was a fire in this house. They raided the house. Uh, King came out, got in his car, and went home. Psychological warfare, to try to destroy the man any way you could. Compared with what was to come, those were merely dirty tricks. A crisis in the White House was to put the president in debt to Hoover, allowing the FBI to attempt to get Dr. King to kill himself. These were busy times for Hoover. The news now broke that Martin Luther King had won the world's most prestigious honor, the Nobel Peace Prize. The news drove Hoover into a frenzy. The FBI's Domestic Intelligence Division now prepared a book entitled Martin Luther King Jr. 
is personal conduct. A copy was sent to Bill Moyers, the President's Deputy Chief of Staff, with a letter asking permission to send the book to members of the Cabinet. Moyers agreed. Copies were sent to the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, Robert McNamara at the Pentagon, and John McCone, Director of the CIA. But Hoover wanted to share his files on King with the public. He ordered his staff to use their contacts in the press to get the story out. One such contact was the chief Washington correspondent of the Los Angeles Times, David Kraslow. He told me that Dr. King was a notorious womanizer and that he'd had a number of sexual escapades and that they, the Bureau had proof of this. And uh, he says, well, let me read you a portion of one, one of these uh, tapes. And he began to read from a transcript. Uh, the raunchiness is beyond description. What shocked me was I knew that he was high enough up in the hierarchy of the Bureau that this could not have been done without Hoover's blessing. It was despicable. It's none of their business. No reporter touched the story. Hoover now returned to his attack on Dr. King. He invited two women reporters to his office for a background chat. He talked about the need for moral purity in public life, and then stressing that his next remark was on the record, he called Dr. King, quote, the most notorious liar in the country. The remark appeared in print. When the news magazines picked up the story, at least one civil rights leader called for Hoover's resignation. King himself mildly protested that the FBI chief must be suffering from overwork. But on the telephone to a friend, King called Hoover senile. And when the FBI monitors put that in their logs, Hoover went public again in a barely coded speech in Chicago. When man places himself above the law, he aids the communist relentless effort to destroy the ideals of our civilization. The man who has no objective values by which he judges his actions, who allows his passions to run wild, unchecked by a moral standard of what is right, that man is surely risking the loss of his immortal soul. What Hoover's agents did next verged on the criminal. Sullivan took his favorite tapes to the FBI's audio labs, where senior technician John Matter transferred the most incriminating parts to a single reel. A third agent, Lish Whitson, flew with the tape to Miami Beach and posted it from there to the King family home in Atlanta, together with an anonymous letter. FBI Atlanta agents listened in to make sure that the package had safely arrived. Martin called and said, uh, uh, better come over. I want you to hear something that uh, Mr. Hoover has sent us. And uh, so I went over the next day, and uh, we sat down and listened to the tape. And, and uh, we never listened to all of it because it became boring. But about 90% of it was inaudible. It was clear evidence of the extreme desperation of Mr. Hoover to destroy Martin. And uh, Martin didn't tell me over the phone that there was a note accompanied it that suggested he ought to take his own life. Years later, a handwritten copy of that note was found in William Sullivan's desk at the FBI. Here is an extract. King, look into your heart. You are no clergyman, and you know it. Like all frauds, your end is approaching. Lend your ear to the enclosure to your hideous abnormalities. There is only one thing left for you to do, and you know what it is. You have just 34 days in which to do it. You better take it before your filthy, abnormal, fraudulent self is bared to the nation. When we read that, we were furious with Mr. Hoover. We had prayer, and then we, we, we laughed at him. Uh, how ignorant, how uh, unaware they were of the depth of our commitment to the struggle, to think that that that, that kind of gossip and slander would drive Dr. King to take his own life. It seems highly unlikely Hoover ever told the president about this last ditch effort to dispose of Dr. King. Nothing as outrageous was ever tried again. But the bugging continued 
all through the Johnson years until the day King was murdered in 1968. The uh, FBI at the time was an institution was out of control. It was a lawless institution uh, from its own point of view even. And it was directed by a man who I think was truly demented. The existence of the King surveillance tapes only became known three years after Hoover's death in 1972. A court subsequently ruled that their content be sealed until the year 2027. 